all things are possible. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Hallelujah, let's praise the Lord this morning. You know, in the scriptures, I don't know that we realize just how powerful when he says, with God, all things are possible and nothing is unstoppable. The power of Almighty God, I think we limit sometimes the power of God because of our own resistance or our lack of faith or understanding truly what the power of God is and how we can use that God says as children uh, of the Most High, that we have the great privilege and to pray over people, pray Jesus over churches, pray Jesus over the nations and the cities. I mean, we have that power over people, and it's only because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's go to him in prayer today. Father God, we thank you that you are unstoppable, and that, Father, that you are here with us. Father, we acknowledge you we, as we pray upward. Lord, we know that you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Father, we know that there's protection and provision that comes from you. Father, we thank you for your forgiveness and for your grace. Father, thank you for accepting us, sinners. Lord, we're not perfect. We're just trying to live a life to be more like you and less like us. So, Father, thank you that we know who we are and whose we are. We know that we've been bought with a price. We know that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And, Father, we just praise you today for you are with us and you're among us. You are Emmanuel. And so, God, we thank you for your presence. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would just breathe through this church, pour through this church. Lord, let us feel your presence today. Let us understand that without you, we're dead, but in you, we're living water. Father, thank you for your grace again and your love. Thank you for your presence, and we welcome your presence into this place, into this sanctuary. And we pray Jesus over your people. We pray Jesus over the message today. Stir within our spirits, Father, and forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In your holy name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Remain standing as we sing Holy Water. Like the 
sound of the symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Listen. Dead men walking, slaves to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptized. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your song. <laughs> I'm thankful for his grace. I'm thankful for his forgiveness. And I hope and pray that I know him, even in my own life that I don't abuse his grace. I think we're all challenged, you know, in our daily walk. What do we allow to manifest our spirit of the flesh? And I'm thankful for his grace that's all sufficient for me. This morning, we want to welcome you to New Hope. Turn around and welcome somebody to church. We are blessed that you're here with us. If you've tuned in today, we're glad that you're with us as well. God bless you.
Well, a good morning. You can go ahead and make your way back to your seats, please. We want to say thank you for joining us today. My name is Pastor Luke. I am one of the assistant pastors here. Thank you for joining us today, whether you're here in person, you're joining us online, maybe you're watching later throughout the week. Trish is going to bring us up to date on New Hope for Recovery and the events that will be taking place this month. Hi, family. Hey, who can bring me up to date? No, I'm just kidding. So we have some things going on this month. Um, this is uh, Overdose Awareness Month, so it's really big in, our, in the recovery community. Um, the first thing we have coming up is next Saturday. It's an early one, y'all. So if you have signed up to do the Around the Beach Walk Run, <laughs> We will, New Hope for Recovery, we'll have a table set up there with information. We're going to sell some t-shirts. But more than that, um, we'll be walking or running um, with an organization called Running to Be Well Walking. Um, and <laughs> that starts at 8.15. So if you've signed up, if you could be there at 7.30. Um, and that's at Monroe Falls. Yes, Monroe Falls Lake. So that's coming up this Saturday. Also, the over our second annual, I love that I can say that, our second annual overdose awareness event is coming. Yes. I'm so excited. Um, that is going to be August 20th from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. It is a family friendly event. We have inflatables for the kids, we have an ice truck coming, we have some speakers, free food, uh, raffle baskets. Raffle baskets, we have raffle baskets. So I think there's a sign up sheet for raffle baskets. So that's going to go around. Sign up to bring in your raffle basket. Um, also in the binder, if you wanna volunteer for that day, there's different things you could sign up for. But mostly we wanna just share with the community, um, not only about overdose and um, the awareness of that and remembering those that were lost, but that there is hope for recovery in Christ. Okay, so that's happening on August 20th. Um, and then as always, we love seeing your smiling faces on Thursdays. We have dinner at 6.15 and then a meeting at seven. So if you have any questions, just see me or one of the team members. If you just wanna raise your hand if you're on the team, look at that team, that's amazing. And uh, that I'm gonna give you back to Luke. So there was a little confusion, I guess, about the raffle baskets. So what they are, are you take a basket, a bucket, whatever you want, and you fill it with a themed item. So if you were here for the chili cook-off, it is the same concept. So um, I know there at the chili cook-off, there was like a grilling basket where instead of somebody using a basket, they used a little grill and then filled it with items that go with grilling. So the, the basket can be anything you want anything you want to put in there um, if you're not good at wrapping them up you can bring it bring the, everything that goes in it and we will have somebody get them wrapped up what day do we want those due by August 11th. Also in here, there is a sign-up sheet for t-shirts for Circle Fest. So if you have not been in the Talmadge area, you've never went to Circle Fest, what that is, is it's just a big festival they put on down there at the Talmadge Circle. It is going to be happening um, August, what is it? Oh, there it is. It's, it's on this little car that you should pick up, too, to see what's going on. August 13th. So we are going to be setting up a booth down there just to get our information out about the church. And we also have a booth for recovery. So we are going to be, we ordered, um, I believe, 300 of these bands for the church that say, say New Hope Talmadge on one side. And on the other side, they say Circle Fest 2022. And they glow in the dark. So that way we can give them out. We also ordered 300 lip balms with our church information just to give out. We're going to be handing out free snow cones just to let people know that, hey, we are here in the community. That normally starts at about 530 is when they actually start. We'll be getting there early to set up. And then we are also going to be participating in the parade. After dusk, about 9 o'clock, they have what they call the Parade of Lights. We're going to be putting together a float. We'll be walking in the float. We go up, uh, I believe three years ago, they started down at the baseball fields. They go up around the circle and back down. 
During that time, we're going to be playing the song, My Jesus. So start listening to it, memorize it. We're going to be singing it. So the sign-up shirts, the sign-up for the t-shirts are in here as well. There's an image on in there of what the t-shirts are going to look like. If you don't get that during service, it will be out there. This is the color of the t-shirts, and then it will have the white print on the front with the chorus to My Jesus, and then our logo on the back. We have these as a sample, so that way if you don't know what size you are, we have adult sizes small through 4X, that way you can see what size you are. We're gonna keep these at a low cost of $10, so that way everybody who comes to Circle Fest, you can have one. Please get your name down, because we gotta get those shirts ordered this week. Next week will be pancake breakfast. There will be no class. Join us at 9.30 for pancake breakfast. Pick up one of these cards so you know what is going on and pay attention to our Facebook page. Thank you, Pastor Luke. Let's rise to our feet as we sing Desert Song.
you know, in that, in that song. It says, this is my prayer in the desert. You know, and I, I'm, I'm thinking that even when Jesus, after he was baptized, we've talked about holy water. You know, Jesus was baptized, and he went directly for the 40 days into the wilderness. And Satan came and tempted him. And it was during that time that I really believed he cried out to his father and knew what it was like to almost feel before, you know, before his death and on the cross and before the, the pain on the cross, he knew what it was like to feel alone. And yet he cried out to God and says, you know, I will give you praise no matter what comes my way. So I hope that today, no matter what you're going through, I want to encourage you that, you know, no matter what season of life you're in, my prayer has been that in the seasons of my life, that God will always teach me some of the greatest truths and lessons that I can maybe gain from it and become a better Christian. Because I know that we're all, we all face some form of valley experiences, don't we? where there's hardship and there's loneliness, and yet we know that God is there with us. And so I'm thankful for the seasons of life, and, and I will give him praise for everything that he's brought me through and is going to take me through as we're all refined by his grace and his love. Let's just acknowledge him and worship him. Great are you, Lord.
Bible says he is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. So we'll do our Bible decree this morning. If you got your Bibles, lift them up. Say, this is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. Children, we're dismissed. Amen. This morning, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. We're going through a series of God's story through God's people series. Last week, we understand what Noah went through, and he had the ark, and, and what that looked like. But it was an amazing story, the promises and the covenant of God about the rainbow. And today, I labeled this message, Life Lessons During Difficult Times. Life Lessons During Difficult Times. Running from God does not prove beneficial, but following God will lead to times of sacrifice, provision of needs, and the hope of redemption. So let's follow together in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, and here's what it says. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was... Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the name's from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married a Moabite woman, one named Orpah, and the other Ruth, after they had lived there about 10 years, and her husband. So today, we're going to see what running from God does. Following God will lead us to do what? Three different things. Times of sacrifice, and I'll be highlighting these things, provision of needs and the hope of redemption. Many of us here today have faced difficult times in our life. There are many here right now that may be facing difficult times, period. But no matter what the hardships we face, God has a plan, and not only does he have a plan, but he's also able and willing to provide his strength for us to be able to endure, to get through, and experience hope. And today we're going to be going through the book of Ruth. It is my hope that as we examine the situations and people that we find in the book of Ruth, that we will learn some life lessons to deal with difficult times and truly understand and know the hope that we have. Ruth is only four chapters long, very simple, very romantic, very powerful, yet you see the stamp of God and his redemptive power in it. You see that Ruth, I really believe, is the virtuous woman. It says that she was a lady of virtue, and I believe that Proverbs 31 probably references both of those as you look at them and, and what a godly lady she was. It is a great story, and we're going to read most of it by the end of the message today. You're like, wow, pastor, that's a lot of reading. But I'm going to, by a synopsis of some of the first chapter, and read a few verses toward the end. So if uh, you guys would just stay with me in Ruth 1, and then we'll see what happens you know, by the end of the message. We find in this first chapter that a man and his wife and two sons who are Jews, what do they do? They leave Israel because there's a famine and they go to the country, Moab. There the man dies and leaves the wife and two sons and the two sons get married to a Moabite woman. Then after about 10 years, both the sons die, leaving the wife and mother, Naomi, and the two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. Naomi hears that the famine is over in Israel and is going to head back, and her daughters-in-law are going to go with her. Naomi is bitter and doesn't want her daughters-in-law giving up their lives to come back with her, so she urges them to go back to their families and yet also 
to their gods. One daughter-in-law, Orpah, heads back, but Ruth does not turn back. And beginning in Ruth 1.16, here's what it reads, and here's what it says. But Ruth replied in verse 16, and she says this, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. In verse 17, where you die, I will die, and where I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Verse 18, and when Naomi, Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Then it says there in verse 22, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Okay, so in the synopsis this morning, I gave the story. And we find that Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, and their sons leave Israel and head to Moab to live there. In our day and age, that doesn't seem like too big of a deal. They are departing because there's a famine and they are going where there is food. But what is happening here is that Elimelech and his family are running away from God and his discipline of Israel for their unfaithfulness. Now, a lot of times, and I'm not going to get off on a little bit of a tangent, but a lot of times when, when I refer to Ruth, Becky was going through a box this past week, and she and I, when I was going through Bible college, uh, we did a study on the book of Ruth and, you know, the covenant between Ruth and Boaz and what courting looks like and dating and all that kind of wonderful <sighs> things. But today, we're going to look at this just a little bit differently. Hopefully, you'll have a different understanding because as I go over the next few weeks, I believe that God is, is uh, like putting me in a position to talk about different characters of the Bible that I normally wouldn't speak about. You know, that where there is a God story and, and where there's some difficulty that goes with it. But Israel was the land of promise for the Jews, and we all know that, right? That was, that was God's promise to them. It was the place where God's presence was. But Elimelech and his family, they're leaving Israel for Moab, is the same as running away from God. Now look at this picture. So we know that the promises of God are true. We know that there's blessings upon the children of Israel. And yet, what are they doing? They're running away from God. And I love that, that picture that I saw there. Because Elimelech says, okay, as the leader of this home, I'm going to take all of you out of here. I'm going to take my sons. And all three of the men lost their life. But I do believe that often, you know, we have a tendency to do things. But God does, you know, one of these numbers and brings us back to where we need to be in the right fellowship with him. And we start noticing that we start walking with God. One thing we should realize is that running away from God is never beneficial. Running away from God is never beneficial. They run away to what they think will be greater pastures, a better life for their family. And at least in the midst of their temporary difficult circumstances, they start to see things take place. So let's look what happens. Elimelech, he dies there. His, care, his kids marry, let me spit it out here, Moabite women, which is not prohibited, but not looked upon well within Israel. And then the sons die. Now, we don't know the reason they died, just the scripture says that they died. And that, you know, that's what happened. But for sure, the benefit that they were hoping to find in this land away from God did not appear. The reality is that we aren't much different than Elimelech. We're always looking for something. We're always searching for something, finding something. We think that when we step outside of God's will and God's plan for our life, that there's going to be better and greener pastures. And when we are facing difficult times, we think that God does not know how to best work in our lives. So, as God doesn't seem to be doing what he, we think he should be doing, we would just as soon leave God out of the picture and take control of our own life because we feel we can do it much better. But Eve is Elimelech's view. God's not providing for me here. So he runs from God, from the land God had provided for him, from worshiping him to a land where he felt he could better live his life on his own. 
But things didn't work out for him. Things just didn't work out so well for Elimelech. And if you run from God during times of trouble, they will not work out as you hope either. No matter what troubles that you are facing right now, it's always best to stay in close relationship with the Lord, trusting him, following him, and worshiping him. It's not always easy, but it's always best. You know, it's interesting for me because I hear people say all, all the time that uh, one of the, the things through death or through loss or financial hardship or whatever might take place, they shake their fist towards God. And what do they do? They walk away and they say, well, I'm going to take this route. It seems to be much better. Well, I know this. I know that there are promises from God that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He says, what is the depth, the width, and the height of his love? He loves us so much. He says that his everlasting arms will pick us up. And I believe that for many of us, no matter what hardships you go through, listen, if you're going through hardships, then you're a good target. My daughter said this last week, and, and, and I'll say it again. You know, thieves don't break into empty houses. If there's something special that you have, he's after you, right? So we know that God's always doing something great within us. We know that it is best not to run from God. We understand that we need to realize that following God will lead us to a time of sacrifice. Following God will lead us to a time of sacrifice, and we see this in regards to Ruth. Elimelech and his sons have died, leaving three widows. Naomi, the mother-in-law, along with Orpah and Ruth. Now, I'm going to say this because you guys know how, how sometimes I can just be and when you look down, for years, every time I saw that, I never saw the R. And I'm like, oh, that's where Oprah got her name. <laughs> so now today, I actually put it in red letters. Because if I do say Oprah, you're all going to fall on the floor laughing. And so I actually put Orpa so that I would say it right. But then I thought this too. Why does that sound like a whale? Like Orca, Orpa, I don't know. Maybe that's where I'm getting it from, but there's all kinds of things that go through your mind. It's difficult when you're, when you're, when you're me. I just thought I'd tell you. All right, back, back to, our, to our story. Settle down, Trish. Now, Naomi is the one who is Jewish and has a heritage of worshiping the true God. Now, watch this. But I would argue that she is not a very good witness of God's goodness to her two daughters-in-law. She not only fled with her family to Moab, but she encourages her daughters-in-law to go back to their false gods and go back to their family. But somehow Ruth, I believe, has come to a point of believing in God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, and she's willing to truly make sacrifices to follow him. She's willing to leave all that she knows to sacrifice at least from a human perspective, the possibility of getting married and to devote herself to her mother-in-law. Now, why do I think that Ruth has come to know the Lord? Let's dig into this. Because here's what she says in the scripture. She calls Naomi's God her God. So she made it personal. Where back then, as she told both of the girls, go back to your country, worship your false gods, but here she makes it personal, and then she uses the name Yahweh. When she says, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me, she's not willing to go back. She's not willing to go back to the false gods that she grew up with. And she's binding herself on oath before the God of the universe and declaring him as the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings as her God. And not only does she declare it, she follows through in her actions, showing the reality of her faith as she spoke it. She does what she knows to be right, supporting her mother-in-law, who has been left without any support, She's not following the Lord because it is convenient for her. She's following the Lord because she believes that he is the one true and living God. So let's make this personal. How about you? What about you? Do you follow the Lord only when it's convenient? 
Do you follow the Lord only when you can't understand what he is doing? Do you follow the Lord only when things are right in your eyes? Like many of the people of the time here after Judges. Are you willing to follow the Lord even when it requires sacrifice, when it's not pleasant in the moment, but hard? And realizing that following God or following the Lord is going to require sacrifice, but the sacrifice is only temporary because it is impossible to outgive God. How many of you have actually said, I'm going to do something that's uncomfortable? You know, getting up, how many of you woke up tired this morning? Yeah, okay, so most of us, it's that season, it's summer. You know, I, I don't know what it is. I, we could blame anything on any season, but I think we, we all know that summertime, we're out doing activities. It it's, doesn't get dark at 5 o'clock where you're in bed at 7. It's dark at 9.30 and you're in bed at 12. So I think you're just not resting like you're supposed to because you're out there partying and all kinds of things are taking place all over the area. So it's a great sacrifice to come. I mean, you have to tell yourself, here I am, I'm going to do this. But listen, the sacrifice is great. You know, I, when I preach on tithing, uh, which I haven't in quite a while here, but because I believe that our church understands the, the principle of tithing. But let's just think about this. If we give of our tithe, our time, and our talent, and if you just sacrifice 10% of that throughout your week, throughout your year, have you ever done the numbers? You know it's funny when we go get our taxes done, we start comparing numbers. And why are we comparing numbers? Because I know what you're thinking, the same thing I'm thinking. You want that return to be bigger than what you owe. That's why you start comparing numbers. You're like, oh no, do I have enough deductions? Or what's it going to be like? How, you know, what is my return going to be? I better claim zero instead of one or two. You know, I've got 1,200 children, but I better claim zero instead of 1,200. Whatever it might be, but what is your sacrifice? The sacrifice is great. Do you sacrifice of your time? When was the last time that you said, you know what? I'm going to, to give just some of my time because I believe that it's so important. Listen, church, I can put you into a challenge. No matter what gifting you have, no matter what resources you have, you can never outgive God. I've had people come to my office and they'll say, Pastor, we're broke. I said, I understand. Let's start right off with this. Do you tithe? And they'll say, no, we don't have the money to tithe. I said, and that's why you're broke. If you don't tithe, one thing that my wife and I have learned, and we've grown through the whole process, we learn and we mature, and we, we're just like everybody else. And I think as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, those are the things that you do. But we've noticed that giving, you know, in the Old Testament, it says God will open up the windows of heaven, but there won't be room enough to receive it. So, you know, if, if you're giving and you're tithing like you're supposed, which is 10th, as the Old Testament commandment, but let's just go ahead and jump way over into the New Testament, where the New Testament says what? God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. <laughs> Isn't it fun to give? So we should, you know what we all should do? We should be so excited that right when church is over, instead of we pass the plate and we do one of these numbers, As the, pass, as the plate passes, or we say, you know what? This is exciting. I get to give. You know why? Because God provided gas for me this week. He provided a job for me this week. He provided food on my table. He provided a washing machine to clean my clothes. He provided air conditioning on a hot, humid day. He provided a place of worship where I can come and meet him every week. You know, we, we have a tendency to, to look more at the negative instead of the positive. And when that, that couple and couples that have come into my office and we've talked about the one component, as you know, there's five components if you've ever been to Love Encounter. And uh, one of the five components that we teach is financial. And in that financial component, I tell everybody, if you want God to truly bless you, then you'll give. And I promise you, God will give it back. So it was, it was cool because one couple said to me, uh, you know, it, that's a big sacrifice. And I said, I know it's a big sacrifice, but let's just pray right now because he says he loves a cheerful giver. How much do you want to start giving? Let's put it in your budget. So they didn't feel like they could give 10, 
10%. And I said, okay, let's do the New Testament. Let's, what would make you both happy and just feel good about yourself? And so they told me the amount, and it, it was really great because as I was standing at the back door, and as I do on Sundays, uh, they were walking out the door, and they're like, Pastor, this is amazing. And I said, what's amazing? They said, you know, this guy walked up to us, and he said, I have something for you. I've never even spoke to the guy before. And he walked up to us, and he went like this. Here, I have a gift for you. And he said, they put it in my hand, and I looked down. Do you know it was the exact amount that we gave? He said, oh, that was week number one. So now they're getting excited. This is going to be a, a great moment for them. They're getting excited. Well, right, because there's joy with that. You start to see God give through sacrifice. And so then he, the next week, they did it again. They're like, oh, this is, this is really going to get exciting. We're going to up it. We're going we're gonna to challenge the Lord. So they put it in there. He said, so we get to our car. Now, this is how it happened. They got to their car. There was money that they had lost in the same amount that they put in the offering. Isn't that amazing? Another couple walked up to me and said, hey, pastor, we've been waiting for this check for such a long time. So we wrote out our tithe and we gave. And, uh, you know, all along, we've just been, we've just been broke. And uh, he said this check appeared in the mail that we've been waiting for for over a year. I said, you know, isn't it amazing just how good God is? But he wants us to sacrifice. He wants us to give. God loves. And that's where we have, I know for Becky and I, again, I'm not saying this to make it make you feel uncomfortable, but Malachi chapter 3, if you want to look into it, you're more than welcome to. But, uh, you know, the principles of God's word and the truth is still there. But it's wonderful to be able to understand what sacrificing is all about. Given it shall be given unto you with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, like shake and bake. Oh, that wasn't in there. And running over shall the Lord add to your bosom. I want a church that's obedient. And that's why I don't make it, we don't make it an emphasis. You know, back when COVID hit, we made a decision that we wouldn't pass the plate and that people would just give. They said, Pastor, do you want us to have ushers coming up front? And, you know, it's so funny because a couple of my pastor friends, they've said to me, did you take away people's ministry? I mean, that's their ministry. You know, you have to have so many ushers and they'll come forward. And, and I said, no. But one thing I do love is that they're in the back. We don't make that an emphasis here. And I want you to know, church, in 17 years, God has provided for us. So we go by faith. This is his church. We are the bride of Christ. We are the body. We are the assembly. And God knows needs better than I will ever know or the board will ever know or you will ever know. But let God use you because I know how valuable that is in your life. And I, want, I love hearing stories. I love to hear the excitement and the joy that comes from people when they give. All right, so we keep moving here. So now we're going to take a transition back to Ruth chapter 2, okay? So let's continue in this story. And here's what it says in Ruth chapter 2. Follow along with me as I read verses 1 through 18. I think it's important. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. That's very, very important to understand that when it says clan, because it talks about his kinsmen. He, it, you're, what we have to see in the scriptures is that, you know, God is using him right now for provision for protection, and so we start to see in Jewish law that things are starting to fall, fall into place. So she went out and entered into a field and began to glean. Okay, here we go. Verse 4, so then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. So look to the person next to you and say, the Lord be with you. And the Lord be with you also. Did you feel like you were in your old Catholic church? Okay, I just thought I'd ask. I figured. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? 
Because he was like, hey, baby, what's up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She's a good-looking lady over there, that Ruth, I'm telling you. Anyhow, so the overseer replied, she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field who has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me found that very interesting, but there was a claim, and as I was looking at the scriptures, not only in the NIV, but I was looking in the New King James Version as well as the King James Version, how he made it very personal right here. So he said, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Because we have to go back to the kinsman spirit. And understand Jewish law, and I will get to that in just a minute because I think this is such a great text. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And then in verse 13, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. It says at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it into wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to this men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. He carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over, and she had eaten the, enough. I'm sorry, that she had eaten enough. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Okay, so let's pause here. Another lesson we need to learn is that even as we sacrifice to follow following the Lord, following God will lead to provision of needs. Provision. Of needs. Ruth comes to Israel with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and they are poor. So Ruth goes out to do what? What was she doing? She was gleaning in the fields. This is how God had told Israel to provide for the poor. When harvesting their fields, the Israelites were not to strip the plant bare, nor the harvest at the edges of the field, but they were to leave some so the poor could come and glean or gather up the bits that were left by the reapers. Isn't that interesting? This is how the poor would be cared for. They could come and work. They could come and collect what they could from the leftovers of the harvest. Now, there would be some people in this situation who would say that God is not providing for me. I have to go out and provide for myself, and I'm only barely getting enough to sustain myself. We say this a lot. Others would be in this situation and say, God has mercifully provided a place for me to glean so that myself and my family are being provided for. But I believe that God has designed us to work. God has designed all of us to work. Giving people money or food without work is a terrible idea. God has here designed a system of provision that discourages greed and provides for those who will work. What's the scripture say? If a man doesn't work, he doesn't. And notice that as Ruth seizes the avenues that God has provided for them, she and Naomi are what? They're provided for. And you'll notice that back in the beginning of Ruth, 
we see that those who should have known God, which was who? Elimelech and his family. What are they doing? They run from God. And it is not beneficial. They do not experience God's provision. Yet, we see Ruth here, a foreigner who has come to know God following the Lord. And what does she find? She finds provision. Let me make this applicable. I believe this is where we struggle as Americans. This is where we struggle as Christians. For us to feel provided for, we think we need to have as much as everyone else. Nowhere are we promised that. In fact, the Bible tells us that generally speaking, we're going to do what? We're going to reap what we And as we follow the Lord, we will be provided for. This is a promise that is confirmed by Jesus in the New Testament. I like what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Here's what it says. But seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be what? Added. They will be given to you as well. They will be provided for. Follow him. Trust him to provide for your needs. Taking matters into your own hands apart from the Lord does what? It leaves you vulnerable. It leaves you vulnerable to do what? Of attack and to experiencing need without provision. Now let's continue because I want to get through the scriptures this morning. Let's continue on and finish the book of Ruth and see what else we can learn. There's a lot of scripture this morning, but I love it. So we're going to start with Ruth chapter 2, verse 19. Then I'm going to go through uh, chapter 4, verse 10. And it says here, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. I don't know, I just said it. The Lord bless him. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Now, in the NIV, it'll say also guardian redeemers. But I want you to see that it says kinsmen redeemers. So if you have that in your Bible, you can, you can circle that in verse 20. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Verse 22, it says this. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servants' girls to Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Now we're going to go right into uh, Ruth chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 3. I'm going to take you right over into verse 3. One day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is it not Boaz with whose servants, girls, you have been a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice, note the place where he is lying. Then go in and cover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. In verse 5, it says, I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Now, this is kind of, I call this God's humor. If you're supposed to be sleeping by yourself, they use the word startled. But I believe that the ghost came right out of him, because if I felt somebody at my feet, I'd probably be like, ah, and run out of there, right? But it was so kind of the Holy Spirit to say, He was startled at something. And so he looks at her very lovingly, gentle, and kind. Not really. Who are you? He asked. I'm your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. Wow. Since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. You know, it is is amazing that right there we start taking 
notice of the kinsman redeemer and how that starts to play out in scripture. Church, who is our redeemer? Jesus. So we start right there in the beginning of the Old Testament that we start to notice the the intimacy and she also identifies who he is that he will now become her kinsman redeemer. So in verse 10, it says, The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. The kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger man, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen and kinsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night. Now, even though, I won't get ahead of myself, I'll go back. And in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. That if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it, lie here until morning. Well, just to let you know that in Jewish custom as well, so it says she took her shawl, and when you, in in the, the marriage covenants, which they still practice, she covered him and her up. So they made that union and that bond right there, which I thought was very, very interesting. When you back up the scriptures where it says she was laying on the floor and she covered herself up. So we see the covering that's there as well. So back to verse 14. So she laid his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized and said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring this shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? And she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley. Remember, they're the poor. They're just now coming back to Bethlehem. You know, they're poor. They normally would just come back and, and receive just a little bit of the wheat that was left out there, but saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. What a great guy Boaz was. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Because what she's talking about is there's another one that's closer to them. And in Jewish law, I know this sounds a little bit bizarre, but in order to keep, if your husband, and she was a widow, if your husband were to pass away, then to keep that name continuing to go on in the family, you would have to marry the, the, a kinsman, somebody that's very, very close to the family. And uh, it would be very awkward if something happened to me. My wife had to, to marry, bless her Lord. I won't even say it. <laughs> I told her that this morning over coffee. We were both mortified and said, praise God, we are New Testament Bible believers. And that's how we left it. Ruth chapter 4, verse 4. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate in there and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer, he had mentioned, came along, Boaz said, come over here. He said, come over here, my friend. I need to sit down. We need to have a little chat. We need to talk. So when he went over and he sat down. In verse 2, Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought I should bring you the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not tell me so, I will know for no one has the right to do it except you for I am next in line after you. Well, he said, because I'm next in line, I will redeem it. And then in verse 5, it says, Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth, the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this point, the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it for yourself. I cannot do it. I love how scripture plays out. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. That's kind of stinky, isn't it? (laughs) Just thought I'd throw that out there. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal, verse 9. Then Boaz announced 
to the elders and all the people. Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I've also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. You see, this tells us that Boaz and Ruth get married, have a son, and they name him Obed, who becomes the father of Jesse, ready? Who is the father of who? King David. The last thing I want to focus on is the fact that following God will lead to the hope of redemption. The hope of redemption. Boaz, we learn in these verses, is what? The kinsman redeemer. So what actually is the kinsman redeemer? A kinsman redeemer was the nearest male relative that had responsibility of redeeming his relative's lost opportunities. And if a relative was enslaved, the kinsman redeemer would buy his freedom. And if a relative was forced to sell his property, the kinsman would purchase it and keep it in the family. But if a relative died, leaving a widow without children, as you've heard me say, the kinsman would marry the widow and seek to have children for the dead man to perpetuate and carry on the family name. You know, in the Nepali Fellowship, we call that the caste system. In India, we call that a caste system. If a relative was killed by another, the kinsman redeemer was responsible to seek justice and avenge his death. And I won't go into its Deuteronomy and, and Numbers. We won't have time for that today, but I want you to see here. So we're starting to, to wind things down here, and Ruth follows the Lord. It is the Lord that leads her to the place of finding Boaz as the kinsman redeemer. Now, I want to back up a bit here, and I want you to remember in the beginning of this story, when we talked about following God, following God requires what? Sacrifice. It only requires sacrifice in terms of the moment, the temporary, the stuff that won't last. Because the reality is that even as we sacrifice, God is leading us to something better. God has led her into a relationship with himself and he blesses her. Think about this. He blesses her by directing her path to a kinsman redeemer. If she wasn't following the Lord, she would not have been led to this place, this place of hope for redemption. Now, while the story of Ruth is a beautiful love story of a couple from ancient history, it is also symbolic to the story of us. You see here, listen church, we are Ruth. Ruth symbolizes us, those in need of redemption, being saved from sin. Listen church and follow with me. And here's what it says. The Lord has laid before us a path to follow. And the path is apparent. The path of apparent sacrifice, but as we make the choice to follow the Lord through that sacrifice, it leads to provision and it also leads to hope, especially the hope of our Redeemer because we are in need of redemption. We are slaves to sin. We have no hope of overcoming without a Redeemer. And just as Ruth is symbolic of us in this story, Boaz symbolizes Jesus, our kinsman, Redeemer. Boaz is the one who is able to do what? To redeem Ruth, to save Ruth. Jesus is the one who is able to be our Redeemer. And the requirements of a kinsman Redeemer, now not Anyone could be a redeemer. We have to realize that. Not everybody has that capabilities or the possibilities there. But there were four requirements that had to be met, and I'll say this quickly. He had to be a kinsman. In Hebrews chapter 2, 
Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Tells us Jesus became man to free us from the slavery that we were in. And then verse 14, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death too. He had to be free. The kinsman redeemer, the redeemer had to be free. And in Hebrews 4 verse 15, it tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. He was not a slave to sin. And then third, he had to be able to pay the price. Since he had no sin, he's the only one who was able to pay because he was infinitely righteous. And then finally, he had to be willing. This requirement was what the nearer kinsman than Boaz did not meet. Because here's what happened. He was not willing to make the sacrifice that may have been necessary. Who was willing in this story? Boaz was willing. And yet in our life, Jesus was willing. When Jesus was talking about the sacrifice that had to be made by laying down his life for ours, said in John 10, 18, that no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He did it all on his own. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He meets all the requirements and he wants to redeem you, church. So as I close, I have a question for you. Have you been redeemed? Are you redeemed? We hear the word often. Yet I believe in our Christian circles, we use it, but we don't understand it. Have you received the redemption that is only available through the one kinsman redeemer that is able to meet every requirement and save you out of a life of slavery, out of, li out of a life of sin, and into a life of fulfillment? Jesus Christ is that redeemer for us. He is the king, the descendant of David, and actually a descendant of Ruth and David. I'm sorry, of Ruth and Boaz, yet of King David. And this morning, maybe you've been coming to church, but you've never received Jesus Christ as your redeemer. Here's her God's story. She once was lost, but now she was found. The Bible tells us that we can do that by believing in him and by confessing that belief in him. We know what Romans 10, 9 says. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you need to receive the redemption that Jesus offers? And if you haven't, Listen, church, you need to. And if you haven't, you need to. For those not living as redeemed, there are others here who have been redeemed and yet you continue to live in poverty. You're gleaning among the harvesters. You have been given your freedom, but you still live as slaves to sin. Realize that you are the bride of Christ. You are the community of Christ and you no longer have to live as a widow. Step in living as redeemed by realizing that redemption that has been given to you and then follow his leading. I believe that many of us don't believe that we're redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Look to the person next to you and say, you are redeemed. You are redeemed. Maybe this week you need to take the steps of faith and baptism. Maybe you need to take steps of faith in serving or steps of faith in trusting. Follow the Lord in obedience and experience the life of the redeemed. If you need to be redeemed, then receive Christ, confessing your belief in him. If you need to live in your redemption, then let's pray for the strength and obey him to truly live in that. Redeemed, redeemed, I've been redeemed. You know, we, we as the, the hymns of old talk about, there's redemption for all of us. And I'm thankful that Jesus Christ became my kinsman redeemer. And that I'm redeemed by the blood of the lamb. 
Here's a poem that reads, Redeemed. Seems like all I could see was the struggle, haunted by ghosts that lived in my past, bound up in shackles of all my failures, wandering and just wondering, how long is this going to last? Then you look at this prisoner and you say to me, son, stop fighting a fight. It's already been won. I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains. Wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I'm thankful that I am redeemed. Let's stand together. Let us pray. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. I once was blind. I once was in sin. I once was in chains. But now I'm found. Father, thank you for lifting those chains. For redeeming us. Taking a story of uncertainty of leaving a place where provision was actually coming, even though there might have been a drought. Sometimes in our Christian life, Father, we we feel like, where are you? Where have you been? There's a drought in our life. I don't hear you. But Lord, I know that your promises are true and that you are a kinsman redeemer, that you went to the cross, you died for us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. You love us, you care for us, and you are our redeemer. So God, today, thank you for being in our space. Thank you for being among us. Thank you for allowing us to to fill your Holy Ghost, to fill your Holy Presence, to fill the Holy Spirit and know that, God, there is is safety and peace in your presence. So, Father, today I pray Jesus over this congregation. Father, thank you for your redemptive power. And, Father, for those that are in this room, Father, I pray that, Lord, as they're seeking out you as their Redeemer, Lord, I pray that if they've never confessed you as Lord and Savior, that today they will do just that. Today is their day of salvation. Lord, they just need to admit that they're a sinner. Believe that you are the Son of God, that you died, and to confess those sins and to live eternally. Lord, we know that, Lord, we need to make a commitment, and that commitment is not just the very beginning of where we were born again, but, Father, where we continue to mature Lord, we know that we're sinners. We know that this world has a way of keeping us chained down and chained up. But Father, I'm thankful for your amazing grace that our chains are gone and we're free because, Lord, there's enough forgiveness. You said if we shall confess our sins that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all the bad things, all the wrong thoughts, all the wrong things that we've done. Thank you, Father, that you are our Lord and Savior, that you are our Redeemer. And so, Father, today, for those that are here, stir within their spirits to come to you, to release those things, Lord, that that have kept them in bondage, to lay it at the altar, to lay it at the foot of the cross, and know that there is hope in you as our Savior and our Redeemer. Father, I love you. I ask this in the holy name of Jesus. In the perfect name of Jesus, amen and amen. Would you come as we sing together? Maybe you've been wandering. I don't know where you've been or what you've been through, but this altar call might be for you today. He's the only one that can ever hold us together. Maybe you need to say, Lord, I know that you are my redeemer and I claim that again today. I'm going to rededicate my life back to you. Would you come? What is your God's story? Where have you put your faith and trust in him? Do you believe? Do you have faith? Do you know that he can get you through and see you through? trust in you and know that you are with me forever. I'll confide in you cause you're the only answer that matters. Even in the darkness, you will be my light. Even
trust in him this morning. I will trust in you, your thoughts and plans of me. Expecting that is there's still some at the altar. I want to just take just a moment. How many of you believe in the Redeemer? Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that we have a, a Redeemer in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord? And I'm grateful that we can call upon Jesus Christ. I know that in past days, I need to know who my Redeemer is, and I'm, re I'm reminded of who our protector is. We know that he is what he says he is, that he'll hold us together, that he's with us, that he's among us. And I'm grateful that in, even in this narrative and in this story, that even with Ruth, you know, can you imagine we, we always think we, we know what is best in our lives. But they left an area where God's promises were already there. He already said that the nation of Israel will be blessed. But so many people turn their focus somewhere else. They turn their face in another direction. They lose that hope in Jesus Christ and their Redeemer. And they go to these places. They lost the very people they love. They lost their husbands. We need to be careful, church, to continue to keep our face turned towards the cross, towards our Savior, and towards our Redeemer. Do you receive that today? God bless you, and thank you for being with us, Pastor Luke. 
Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can gather together freely. We can worship you. We can praise you. But we thank you that you are our Redeemer. And that no matter what we've done, no matter what we're going to do, that you are a Redeemer and that you have already paid the price to set us free. Help us this week to call upon you, to look to you, but help us most of all to be thankful that you have redeemed us. I pray a blessing on each and every person here, each and every person listening today. Comfort them where they need comfort, guide them where they need guidance. Help them to look to you for everything they need. In your most precious and holy name, amen. Thank you guys. God bless you. Again, if you did not see the book, it will be out there, and I can also get you the shirts so you can see what size you will need. Have a wonderful week.